welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I'm so excited to share today's guest with you. James Moore writes in many mediums and many genres, but he creates with two goals in mind, to tap into your emotions and to make you think. So let's meet author James Moore. All right. So uh, it's very exciting to meet you, James Moore. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I was uh, born in Brooklyn, you know, lived there until around 14, and we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. I um, am an ex-Air Force officer, and it was in the Air Force where I met my wife, Donna, and at, I thought I was a career in the Air Force, but Congress had uh, other plans. There was a huge reduction in force, and I had to find a new career, so... I got into uh, computer work quite by accident, and I, I still work in IT to this day, but now I'm dreaming of making a living as a, a screenwriter. Cool. So you live in Virginia Beach, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Did you come to this area because of the military, or did it just work out that way? Uh, it, it just that way. Um, when, when I left the military, we actually moved back to Greensboro, North Carolina, and spent uh, quite a, a few years there raising our kids. And at one point where after the kids were grown up and, and uh, it was it's me and a wife, some, we got into circumstances where the kids were not doing well on their own. We found ourselves in a small town house with a bunch of kids and adult kids and their kids in it. So Donna and I came up with an expand and uh, moved to Virginia. So that's what uh, prompted the move to Virginia. Okay, that's cool. So you've got military background, you got into computers, you're now getting into screenwriting. And I wanna ask you a little bit about that later. But um, I'm just curious, is your wife like excited about the whole screenwriting thing? Yeah, see, uh, my wife Donna, I know this is going to end up sounding like a commercial for Donna Moore, but <laughs> she has uh, always supported what I what I love to do. I've discovered a love for screenwriting. So she's been um, very tolerant and supportive. If we're working on a project and out of the house from dawn to dusk, She's all for that. We've uh, put, um, you know, family resources to these projects you know, to, to make things happen. And she's particularly excited about this interview and how it's going to turn out and is looking forward to watching it online. Oh, cool. That's awesome. All right. So I have one more question for you, and then we're going to get into some of the se segments that I have for the show. But mm -hmm. um, so you've mentioned the screenwriting, but you're also working on a book. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, my writing career uh, started um, quite by happenstance. I did not take the traditional method, what I would think is traditional method with somebody going to college and maybe majoring in English lit and that sort of thing is before writing a book. I, I fell into, just like you might imagine somebody slipping on something and falling into a pool, that's how I got into writing. And my initial thought was, well, I can't write a screenplay too hard. I'll just write a story. That's easy. Anybody can write a story. I'll knock it out in four months. So 18 months later, I'm finishing up my, my first novella and putting the, poli the finishing polish on it. And um, after making a couple of other attempts at writing prose, um, I was able to find a publisher that was willing to you know, put out my work. And that's that book, which is entitled, um, is due to um, come out later this year. I still am scheduled to have a wrestling contest uh, with the editors <laughs> to, uh, you know, you know, that works in the literary world. You wrestle with the editor. They, they tell you, you know, there's not the essence in that word or this character would probably not do that. And then after that is when it's scheduled for release. Okay, so if you could, just because it broke up just a little bit, um, repeat the title of the book again. I'm sorry, the uh, the title of the book is Home, H-O-M, that's the, the title character's name. 
Yeah, so I, I see the book cover. And so I wasn't sure if it was H-O-M or if it was home. So it is home. It's pronounced home. That's correct. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So we're going to get into the first segment of the show that I call the um, bookshelf. I believe that every good writer should be a reader. I'm, I'm, I'm a reading advocate. I think that everybody should have a healthy reading lifestyle, whatever that is for that person. You know, I think... Um, I feel like literacy obviously is important, but I feel like in America, we put a lot more value on entertainment. And I think if people saw reading as a form of entertainment, the way they see movies and TV, it would be, there would be a lot more emphasis on it. So that's just my little soapbox. So I want to ask you a couple of questions and we actually have some questions from some of your fans also. So I'm going to start with a question from Felicia Brown. She asks, is there a classic book you did not enjoy reading? Well, that's a very good question. Um, there's, I would say there's one classic book that I'm, I'm still struggling to fight through, but I want to be able to say in certain circles, oh, yes, I've read that book and, and uh, comment on Melville and that sort of thing is Moby Dick. Um, I've read... Um, I would, I've read a fraction of that book. I have it on the shelf downstairs and struggling with trying to read through that book. But I guess Melville is just not my taste because it's it's kind of a difficult read for me personally. I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's another, it, I'm, like you, it's one that I've started, but never finished. <laughs> I have it and I'll get to it one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have another question for you from the Darden Road Crew. <laughs> they want to know okay. um, how have comic books influenced your reading tastes? Oh yes, that's an, a question. And based on the question, I have a suspicion on who this person is. <laughs> um, when when I was young, I was well. Thanks to mainly my mother is the is the one who really got me on the road of storytelling, storytelling and, and entertainment in general. She's, she, she loved for movies. She has a love for movies. She is a voracious reader. She goes through a book maybe every three or four days. Wow. Um, the Kindle that we got her is, <laughs> it was a, a well thought out present. <laughs> and she's the one that I remember my earliest memory, she would take me and my sisters down to uh, some store. It wasn't a specifically a comic book store way back in that day. It was a store that sold other things, including comics. And even as, as little kids, we get the Archie comics and Casper the Friendly Ghost and stuff like that. That was the age that she started us at. Right. And all through my teenage years, I have collected comic books. And the um, if for people who are not familiar with that genre, the stories vary as wildly as anything else you can pick up and read or watch on television. You can go cartoonish for kids all the way up to dark and scary. Mm -hmm. So it's been an influence as far as helping me realize or write as a visual, you know, artist. You know, when you write something on paper, you the reader to be able to see a picture in their mind of mm -hmm. what's going on. Otherwise, it's not entertaining, it's just work. So <laughs> I think that's the, the main influence that comic books has, has had on me is not just the, the words in the book, but the picture that you're trying to form in your head. Well, I, I love what you, you, what you said about the fact that comic books are so varied. Um, I'm actually a proponent of it. I know a lot of people who I mean, think, I will say that luckily things have gotten better throughout the years. People are more open-minded, but I know a lot of people to this day who will not read a comic book because they're like, I don't like pictures in my books. And that's fine, <laughs> to each his own. But I, I am one of those people that says there is a comic book for whatever topic it is you're looking for. Um, I had a, a, a young man wanting to know more about the civil rights movement, and I recommended the March graphic novel series to him because that's a you know true depiction of what happened at that time in comic book form. So I, I feel what you're saying on that end. And as far as it helping you write more visually, I could totally see that too. So I have another question for you. Um, 
do you set reading goals? I I don't necessarily set reading goals. I think that there was a, a great chunk of my life where I should have. Uh, shortly before I got into writing myself seriously, I was not much, of, and I totally agree with you that there's not an, enough reading being done. And I was one of those people, I can say, hallelujah, I'm a convert now <laughs> that I, I read way more often. And the thing that's changed it for me, soon after I decided to start um, a career as a writer, I really, I really should read more as a writer. It was just after I made that decision that an opportunity in my lap which is kind of proof that God exists and will give you things if you ask him for it. Um, someone in my, my writer's group decided about doing book reviews. And she had asked me if I would be involved in her team, me and one other person in our group. And I was, in addition to being very flattered, said yes, because being involved with that would force me to read at least one book every month. You know, we do a book a month. And the theme with our podcast that she started out is the book. Our goal is to read books with strong female characters. Wow. So if we if we read the book, one of the questions that we answer for the audience is, was this main character a strong female character or was there a strong female character in this book? And um, oftentimes, you know, we we made the right decision and the answer is yes, but sometimes it was no. So <laughs> right. it, this, this, forced, uh, this forced me on a regular reading regimen and getting at least one book in a month, which I think is important. Yeah, that's amazing. And you actually answered what was going to be my next question. So I'll just kind of piggyback off what you said, because I was wondering if you, you know, did um, review books. And so clearly you are reviewing books on a podcast and and you're like giving props to the, you know, strong female characters. So I do think that reading is one of those things that gives you an opportunity to really analyze and process. I mean, nothing, I mean, I'm a big, you know, movie lover, I like TV, I love, I love entertainment, but I feel like there's just this connection that you get with reading that you don't get with those other forms of, um, you know, entertainment that gives you more time to like process. You really get to see, you know, does this have a strong female character in it or not? Because you break it down even more. So I think that's just fantastic. What's the name of the podcast? Oh, the podcast is called Judging More Than Just the Cover. Judging and More Than What? I'm sorry. Judging More Than Just the Cover. Just, that's, I like that. Judging More Than Just the Cover. Yes. And the leader of our group is Amber Gray. She's the one that uh, runs the podcast. And we've been for about years now. That's awesome. I love that. I, mean, I really love doing it. And, and I just feel honored to be working with, uh, you know, two young women. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black man in my 50s. These are two young, um, you know, Caucasian ladies in their, you know, 30s. And it's interesting the perspectives that we bring to each uh, critique. Yeah, I bet I'm definitely going to check that out. I like the sound of it. And that is an interesting combination um, that you guys have for that podcast. <laughs> so I have my little timer go off. So it's now to move on to the next segment of the show. And this is what I call the open book. And it just is kind of an extension, uh, extension of that where we talked about some of your reading habits. But now we're going to talk about some of your um, writing habits. Um, so again, I have a question here from Felicia Brown. And she says, um, where does your inspiration for your plots come from? Well, I would have to say that my true inspiration, when you get to the core of it, comes from the def definition of the word inspiration. It comes from God. So I get inspired. Stories just come to me. And I've heard a lot of artists describe that process, whether they are writers or they're musicians, that sort of thing. They keep a, a, a notebook next to them or some, I keep my phone next if I'm drifting off to sleep, I'll have an idea. And instead of, you know, forgetting about it, I put it in my phone on the book idea. A lot of it comes from just my day-to-day -day experiences. 
I feel like I've lived a, an interesting life, not anything too adventurous, <laughs> but everybody's got drama down in their life. And some of it is um, storytelling worthy, I would say. But my inspiration comes from my regular day-to-day -day life and uh, the relationships that I have with people. I would think that that's the core of it. The relationships that we have is paramount. I think I would agree with that. I know one thing I've also said is that I feel like whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, when you as a writer create something, it's going to be in some way kind of autobiographical because everything that you write, like you said, is based on, you know, you're inspired by the things around you, the things you experience, the things you know, the things you don't know, you know. So I feel like um, that some some aspect of writing is autobiographical. Um, that's just kind of my take on some things. I agree. Uh, so I have another question here and I'll just say this next question I'm excited about because this is why I like opening up the questions to like friends and family and fans because they know stuff I don't know. <laughs> so this next question is again from the Darden Road crew and it says, were there any late night card game situations that influenced your material. I got to know more about this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I definitely know who this, who um, is posing these questions. And I'll just say his name out loud for, the, for America and the <laughs> world. Uh, my, one of my best friends in life, Michael Mitchell, and I and Lizelle Free, we all lived on at one time in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And during the summer, we would, for, for us, the, the sun never went down on, in, we would play three handers until when the more, you know, our parents just let that happen. And uh, we would talk about everything under the sun. I think that friendship, that that bond that I, that I have with uh, Mike Mitchell and Lizelle Free, is really an integral part of a lot of the stories that I write to this I'm like and also through Facebook when I began to announce to the world okay I've written this short story I've submitted that short story that flash fiction or whatever uh, Mike Mitchell is usually one of the the first people to to do a you go get them post or a congratulatory post out there in support of me. So that's something that the big influence in, in what I do now, even outside of writing. That's really cool. It's, it's good to have like that support from like friends and family. But I think, I mean, of course you want your family to be supportive, but when you have a friendship, someone who chooses, you know, to be a part of your life and they're cheerleading for you or, you know, telling you to go get it. Like, I think that's really special. <clears throat> so I have another question here. Um, and this was um, one that I was, um, that I had kind of come up with. Just, this is a question that I like to ask uh, writers, whether you're um, a novel writer, a screenwriter, a poet, whatever. Um, I feel like for me, there was a particular moment that I can think of where I kind of felt like I went from being this person who just liked to write to becoming a writer. So my question to you is, what was that first thing you wrote that made you feel like a writer? That's a very good question. I would have to say the first thing I wrote that really made me feel like I was a, a writer in the true sense in that I had joined the community of writers that are serious about what they do is, um, is the, one of the first screenplays that I wrote. I wrote a screenplay. It was a, it's a short film, and I had gotten involved with a meetup group. The uh, goal of that group was to get skits together, do short films for, for YouTube to try and earn some income. And um, I went to one meeting just as an introductory and spoke with, you know, some of the people there. The person heading up the group gave me say, okay, if you to be writers there are other people that don't want to be directors some other people want to be talent you know and act in them he said you writers here write a few stories that you think that are doable that we can put on youtube because there are restrictions there and uh, bring it back to the next meeting well 
when I came to the next meeting, there was a gentleman that was not at the first meeting and he had gone to uh, that meeting with the hopes of finding somebody who can do that sort of writing. His name is Charles Townsend. I have a relationship with him uh, ever since that moment. And um, he was doing movie making on his own, but in cinematographer, the director, the and and the writer, he was looking to do some writing. And he tell and he told me that of the pile of scripts that were there, he said mine was the only one that was doable and made sense to him. So he spoke and said, let's, he said, this is a great script, let's do it. So we made that little film and a couple of others on that same rainy Saturday. And he finished his job of doing the editing and everything and it turned into a short movie. I saw the words written by James Moore on screen. And that was the moment for me. That was my hit of cocaine <laughs> that said, there's no going back now. You're a junkie forever. And you're one of these strange, weird writing people. I love that story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's how like everybody's story is different, but everybody has that moment. And I think that one was perfect. I, I think it, it all, it's also like a wonderful reflection of the times about how people who didn't know each other came together, met, collaborated and created something. And so I, I love that story. So um, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> sure. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on into the next segment um, here because I have lots of questions that I wanna ask. So this next part of this show is what I call the book signing. And this is where I get to ask or other people get to ask specific questions about some of your work. So um, first thing I wanna start out talking about is the book. Um, I have some other questions here, but what I wanna know is about home. What is the major theme or topic of this book that you're working on home? Well, I'm gonna dip a little bit into how that story got created. I was seeking out opportunities to, to write online and I came across one someone had put out on Reddit um, hey, trying to put a group together to do an animated series. You know, me back interested. And I said, I'm very interested. So we did a few scripts for this animated work out. The team kind of fell apart because um, we, were talking to, we were talking amongst ourselves. There was somebody in South Africa, someone else in Europe, someone else in Asia. So it kind of fell apart as a team. But the leader of the team came to me afterwards and said, I want to put together a video game based on a story. Will you write the story for me? Sure. And he gave me a little basic of the character and said, go with it. Uh, and what he told me was, we have a teenage, a young teenage man who is a government experiment, you know, raised by the establishment, go. And that story turned into a young man who has special powers to be able to um, to be able to talk and walk in the worlds with angels and demons, and fights evil with a you know group of other teens, and goes out and saves the world. And basically, that's what home is about. It's about a young man who is searching for his own individual freedom, but ends up forming a family with some other kids in his own circle in the same circumstance. And they bond together to not only gain their freedom, but to save the world from. A... So now you mentioned um, the video game. So is this story also going to be made into a video game? Uh, unfortunately, because just like the first group kind of fell apart, the second group kind of fell apart as far as design together the video game. But I have an agreement with the the owner of the project that whatever story I write is mine, I can do what I want with it, get it published, whatever. And once I got the book picked up by a publisher, I went back to him and said, you know, maybe we should rev up the video game again. You know, maybe there's some synergy that can be done, but uh, unfortunately didn't have the, the resources or the time to be able to put into it. Maybe someday that'll change. Okay. Uh, if the book is a success, maybe, you know, he'll see that and, and 
get the video game going. I really hope that that happens. But in the meantime, we have uh, just the story. Well, just the story is pretty good, if you ask me. <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's interesting that that's how this kind of started was, you know, this guy was looking for someone to write a story for a video game. I think video games is another one of those mediums where people don't realize how important storytelling is. Um, I used to be a big gamer way back then. I'm not a gamer anymore. I'm not even going to try to pretend like I am. Every time I pick up a game controller, five minutes later, I put it down. But <laughs> I do love, like my husband's a gamer. Um, he has friends that are, and I like watching people play video games just because I like seeing the stories. There are some really creative stories in video games that a lot of people aren't giving credit to. So I just think that's a really cool story. Yes. So I have another question for you. This one is from uh, Felicia Brown. And her question is um, going back to the book home. It says, what was the most difficult or challenging part of writing that story? Well, I would say that the most difficult part of writing that particular story, and and, and this is something that I've tried to change in my, in my writing routine now. At the time that I was writing that story, I was a real pantser. For those who are not familiar with uh, writing and that sort of thing, you have planners and pantsers. Pantsers write by the seat of their pants and planners, they do an outline, they organize things and they know, <laughs> yeah, they know basically what they want from beginning to end. Now, I want to be, be clear in my conversion to becoming a planner, like other planners, you might think that they're rigid and don't make any changes. Well, that's not the case. If you're a true planner, you know that as you're writing the story, you have to be flexible and fluid. You set up a course. You don't have to strictly follow it. You know, there's still inspiration involved. But at the time when I was writing home, I was not at all in no way, shape or form. So I would just be writing it in at the time, I'm thinking, you know, what is going to be the end to this? I had no idea how it was going to end the book. And that was the toughest part of it, especially in developing a character. Are you going to put something in that's going to take too long or it's not logical? Are you going to, are you going to have to start over again? That's the risk that you take in being a pantser. People can do it flawlessly, and that's their style. And God bless them, because that's that's really not what's best for me. I've discovered, what I've discovered is I like to do some kind of outline, have an idea, know where I want to go, but how I get it. But um, when I was writing that particular book, the most difficult thing was wondering, okay, how and when am I going to end this? Yeah, I could I could see that definitely. Because see, I from the start, I've always been a plotter, so <laughs> I get that, but I know people who are pantsers and they like written multiple books. And like you said, God bless them. I couldn't even imagine trying to do that. <laughs> so my next question for you in terms of writing is I like to see like how people, you know, where they get their creativity and stuff like that. And you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier. So maybe you can just kind of expand upon it. I know some people who come up with all their ideas, they write things down in notebooks, you know, I know people who create like vision boards and stuff for like their story. Like what is your like creative process when you're trying to come up with a story? That's a good question. Um, at this point in the game, sometimes what I, what I do to go and get inspiration is I go to the file that I have on my computer, which is called story ideas which started out with one page. Now I have a dozen pages of ideas. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, anything that's fully fleshed out. I'm talking about one line sentences. So imagine five pages of one line sentences on story ideas. So I'm never going to get done with this list, but I continue to add to it. And I think that if you're a is serious and you are enjoying your writing, you should have a list like this that you're never going to be done with. It should be a well that never goes dry. So I go to that for inspiration and get ideas and, and maybe twist and bend some of the ideas together to make new ideas. And if all that fails, I always have the source that comes to me quite often as far as story ideas. And that is my wife. 
<laughs> who will hear something. She'll hear something on the radio or on TikTok and she'll come to me and say, James, you know, you need to write the story about this or you need to do the screenplay on this. And it'll always, it will always be something good without fail. And I wish I had like four or five lifetimes to get through all this stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> you have to pick and choose as an artist. Okay, what am I going to invest my time in? Especially at this point where writing is not my vocation, is not how I make a living. So I have to go out and earn my daily bread with this IT stuff that I do and then get to write. So I hope that's not too much of an answer for that question. No, I love that answer. Yeah, that, that I, I I love that answer. I love I love the fact that your wife just like hands you ideas and stuff. She's like your your pitch agent. She's like, here, I got a story for you. You need to write this. I, I love that. So that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish I had that. My, my husband, I usually share ideas with him. He's like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but he's never giving me ideas, so. All right. So I'm really excited about the next segment of the show. Um, this is where it kind of gets a little bit silly. Um, we've talked about your creative process. We've talked about reading. We've talked about some of your projects. So now this is where we just get to know James. So uh, I got some questions um, from Felicia, the darting crew, and I got a couple of them myself. And so we're just going to, we're going to see what happens. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this first question is from Felicia Brown, and, and it's kind of a two-parter. She, she got jokes. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> Her first question says, <laughs> did they have french fries when you were a kid? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, that, that goes back to a story between me and Felicia, and Felicia, again, of uh, a uh, a, a friend of mine that's been with me from back in the day, I mean, for a long time, somebody that I, I love very much. Um, to, we had worked at a restaurant together and got to, got to uh, know each other. I was working there first as a host, and she came on as a waitress, and we just, you know, bond a bit. And sometimes, you know, rest, I don't know if you ever worked in the restaurant industry, but if you got a certain crew of a certain age, you know, you hang out afterwards. Mm -hmm. And one thing, and she was a very, a very young woman at that time. And then she asked me because I was older than her and she was shocked that they actually had French fries when I was a kid, you know, because, you know, she didn't think, I guess she thought French fries was something that's a recent invention. <laughs> so, <laughs> I assured her, I said, Yes, they've had French fries around for quite a while. And um, so after a while, after laughing at that, she started calling me her BFF before French fries. <laughs> I and, love that. <laughs> as, as a joke. So that's that's something that is kind of a, a inside joke between us that I'm, you know, we're built like before French fries friends. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, when I saw that question, I was like, I am so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she did have another question also. This She said, this is her real question. So <laughs> her real question is, what is one material item that you just can't live without? Material item, which is a really good question because you can you can talk to my wife. I'm I'm not a material person. I mean, I like nice things. I want to be comfortable. That's uh, something that's important. But as far as I need to have that, I need to have that coat or or that car. I'm just not like that. But a material thing that I cannot do without. It's it's a really tough thing. I would have to say that if, if I didn't have, I can't, I, it's really, I'm really having a hard time coming up with something. <laughs> I, would, I would think, you know, if this is gonna be a bailout answer, but if, if I didn't have, you know, my laptop, you know, at all, if I had to write, you know, like, like ancient monks had to do, <laughs> write stuff by hand. I, did. I would not be a writer if you doing something else. I do like the convenience technique, you know, having my laptop or my phone. I could say the combination of that type of tech didn't have that available in some form. 
that would be kind of rough on me to do what I do. You know what? I'm right there with you. Like I, I remember being younger and like writing in notebooks, but now I'm like, what you want me to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely been spoiled by the technology. Um, so now I have a question from <laughs> your boy from the Darden Road crew. Um, so his question is, and, and I'm really excited about this one too, because um, my, you know, one thing I have on my social media profile is I'm a geek girl. So when I ask you this question, I'm gonna need you to explain it. So it says Marvel versus DC, which one? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's where we're gonna get into some kind of controversy because um, I, here's, here's the explanation. Okay. Me, comic books, I was on both sides of the fence. I would do some Marvel titles that I had to have and DC titles that I had to have. And now that that whole genre, the superhero genre is, is kind of in its way into, you know, not just books, but movies and that sort of thing, that Marvel handles things very well and DC does not. In my opinion, the DC movies, oh my gosh, why do you even make them? I know. <laughs> the Marvel movies, as everyone knows, I mean, they're breaking records. They're, they're telling stories in a fantastically creative way. They've put a machine together that almost never fails to do a good story, something unpredictable. They, they hit all their points without being predictable. It's great. Now, let's talk about animation. When it comes to animated movies and animated stories, DC knocks everybody else out of the park. I mean, <laughs> just if you even if you just look at Batman, just all the Batman stuff that they're doing in animation rocks the world. Marvel is like, you know, it's like on a level of Transformers, just <laughs> and the go It's just not doing it for me. They 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 need to. I I wonder why don't you get some of your movies to work on these things? And get the animated stuff good, you know? So when you ask Marvel or DC, it I would say it depends on what am I doing? Am I watching a movie? Am I reading a comic? Or am I, or am I watching an animated movie or a live action or not? So I hope I've answered that question well enough so that people are in their living rooms right now. <laughs> well, I, I loved your answer and I love the fact that you hit on all the important points pointing out the difference between the comic books, the movies, the animation. Like you have to take all of that stuff into consideration. Somebody asked me that question one time and I started going off and they were like, oh, I just meant what you thought about the last movie. And I'm like, well, then you can <laughs> specify that that's what you wanted to know. <laughs> so I, exactly. loved, I loved your answer. <laughs> all right, so I have one more question. I like to throw in something kind of random at the end there. I literally have like a whole list. I just choose them at random. And these are just, it, it's just, there. it's not, let me just tell you what the question is and we'll see what you say. Okay. So if you had to, would you rather write an obituary or give a eulogy? It's strange that I instantly know the answer to that question. I would do the eulogy. There's no question. I would do the eulogy. And tell you the reason why. The reason why is because something I've discovered about myself, you know, as you know, later on in my adult years, is that even though standing up in front of a crowd, you know, makes my, my palms sweat and I'm nervous and all that stuff, if I'm prepared for something in front of a crowd, I am the, the biggest non-kosher ham out there. You know, I, I want the attention. I want somebody to hear what I have to say. Um, the bigger the audience, the better. The more important the subject, the better. If I'm prepared and I'm ready to do it, I'll do a eulogy. There's no problem with that. The obituary, yeah, not, not even close to uh, giving me the attention that I want as a, as a ham. Yeah, definitely eulogy. All right. Well, that <laughs> see, that's one of those questions that when, when when I ask somebody, I just first of all, their eyes usually get big first, and then you know I hear their answer. So I like that. <laughs> well, 
I really appreciate you spending time with me today. Um, that's pretty much what we have. Go ahead and tell the viewers where they can find either you or your work online. Okay. Well, I do have a, um, a blog that I occasionally post to. And um, if you look at um, or blog, it's uh, available online. I wish I had a link to it, but I guess I can provide that later. Where I do movie reviews sometimes, I, the, the real goal, the real goal is to try and get other people who are in storytelling, whether it's they're an artist, um, a movie maker, an, an author, paste their stuff too. Right. And another uh, website that I have put together for everything that I do in, in filmmaking is a Wix site. It's called jemore 451com wixsite.com slash jm filmmaking so and that's the the one i'm most proud of because it showcases all the work i've done in filmmaking so far and there's going to be more to come with that too so uh keep your eye out on that page so Wait. we have come to the end of the show again thank you so much um to the viewers, be sure to stick around for the credits. I always have something fun in there. And to my Patreon supporters, be sure to look out because James has some special content just for you guys. So until next time, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading.